I would have a Bible at the ready. I'd be ready to take a few notes if you are a note taker. The back of your bulletin, by the way, is a great place to jot down some thoughts. There's a little note section there. Um, it is a device that helps you to retain the information that's given. So taking a few notes here and there on the things that really stand out to you is a great way to help get it into your head and into your heart. If you're joining us online, Lord bless you. It's always good to see you folks. Thank you for joining us digitally. And again, thanks for those who are here in person as well. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed your, your snow day last week. But as we assemble once again in person, I want to pick up where we left off. And if you've been away for a few weeks, we have been breaking apart a word that I believe the Lord has placed on my heart for this church at this time. And I want to really just dig right through what was covered quickly, and then we're going to get into some new material. The Lord laid this on my heart kind of at the turn of the new year. So here we go. My people. My people suffer from low expectations of me, what life can be in me, and from low expectations of themselves. I'll read that one more time if it's your first time hearing it. My people suffer from low expectations of me, what life can be in me, and from low expectations of themselves. Now, three weeks ago, I addressed our low expectations as it relates to the Lord and the things that we anticipate in and from him, in a sense, as we walk and live by faith. Now, I am not going to have any time today to summarize that message. I can only direct you to the website, listen to the sermon online, watch it if you have the capability, download the notes, read through them, and let that word, as, as challenging as it was, speak to you and encourage you to go further and, in a sense, to go deeper in your expectations of him. Two weeks ago, the week before the snow day, we, address, we begin to address the low expectations that we have of ourselves as believers. And that message, which is also posted online, emphasizes the fact, and I want to read this from my notes, that far too many believers are far too comfortable with low standards of Christian morality and commitment. We are quick to excuse, diminish, and dismiss sinful and immature living, and this should not be as we are called to live in a manner worthy of the gospel and to live according to our high calling in Christ Jesus. Now, no one in the sound of my voice, including myself, is perfect. And we will never on this side of the grave reach a point of perfection where we have everything mastered. But we are to be committed, disciples of Jesus Christ, living hard after him and embracing the fullness of what he commands us to do. And though we fall short, and thankfully there is grace for that, let's not be careless and just assume that God is fine with sin. He calls us to a place of biblical holiness. And to that everyone says, Amen. Now this morning I want to advance our discussion regarding the low expectations that we have of ourselves, but from a bit of a different angle. And it's going to be simply this for those taking notes. We expect too little of ourselves in terms of Christian witness and service. And I want to begin by asking a question that will kind of help you to understand what I mean by this. Don't answer aloud, but I want to put forth a question to get your wheels kind of a turning a little bit. Here we go. To what degree do you believe that God can use you to change the world. Let me ask you that one more time. To what degree do you believe that God can use you to bring about change in this world and to change the world? And a secondary question is why do we disqualify or downplay our contributions when God calls us to be world changers? And this morning, I want to spend a little bit of time addressing the biblical premise that God has called us, collectively and individually, to change the world. Matthew chapter 5. Please turn there. We're going to look at about three or four verses that will be the foundation for today's thoughts. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read a segment of what's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus addressing his followers, laying out for them the standards of the kingdom, what it means to follow him, the type of life that we are to embrace at the external level in terms of what we do and don't do, and also at the internal level regarding our commitment to him within the inner man. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13. 
Jesus says the following, and again, I want to look at this text through the filter of the fact that God has called you to affect change in this world, to be a change agent on his behalf, and again, simple in summary, to change the world or at least your part of it. Matthew 5, starting at verse 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And finally, verse 16, as far as today is concerned. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and ultimately glorify your Father in heaven. That's a profound text. And what we see here is that the Lord Jesus uses two image to define and to describe who what we are, what we are, and what our role in the world is. We are, you are salt, and we are, and you are light. Salt of the earth, light of the world. What does this mean? What does it mean to be salt? What does it mean to be light? What impact should these things have on how we live in the lives that we live before the Lord? I want to spend some time, really the bulk of our time, breaking this imagery down. Because one of the things that you see in the ministry of Jesus is he very often would use simple, everyday, ordinary elements or items and use them to expose or summarize deep spiritual truths. He would talk about shepherds and sheep and nets and seeds and wheat and tares and a whole host of other things to communicate very deep truths. And here he's using the imagery of salt and light. How many of you are familiar with what salt is? If not, we'll head to the kitchen, go get the little shaker and show you what it is. And of course, we all are pretty familiar with light and beyond. So what does it mean that we are the salt of the earth? Again, the first part of verse 13, if you're going to look at it. You are the salt of the earth. In the ancient world, and it's still true today, salt really had two primary purposes. Now, there are more. You could get into some of the secondary and beyond layers of use for salt. But there are two primary reasons that people used salt in the ancient world. My note takers jot these down. Number one, as a seasoning. It was used to enhance the taste of food. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the other reason is that in a world where there were no freezers and no refrigerators, salt functioned as a preservative. And I want to look at both of these points quickly and how they apply to our lives. Number one, salt was used to enhance or enrich the flavor of food. Salt functioned as a seasoning. Now, let's be honest. How many in the sound of my voice at one point or another you have reached for the salt shaker to add a little bit more taste or to enhance or enrich the flavor of your food? We really have a hard time imagining a table that is fully set, whether it's a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner or if you're out to eat at a restaurant where there's no salt and pepper on the table. We're just used to this as just a part of our culture and beyond. And it was the same way back when. People would use salt to enhance or to enrich the taste of the food. Now, there's an application for us spiritually here. You ready for this? We as Christians, again, collectively and individually, are called to flavor this world before the Lord, to enhance and to enrich it. And I want to read this to you from a commentator that I like. The author says, Christians living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to Christ will inevitably influence the world for good as salt positively influences the flavor of the food at seasons. We bring enrichment. And he continues, where there is strife, we are to be peacemakers. Where there is sorrow, we operate as ministers of Christ, binding up the wounds. Where there is hatred, we are called of God to be agents of love and harmony, being a people who return good for evil. Now, I want you to consider for a moment how Christians over the course of nearly 2,000 years have enriched this world through faithful, dutiful, and sacrificial service. 
I jotted down a few thoughts. How many orphans have been cared for over the millennia and found loving homes because of believers? How many orphanages globally have been erected for this cause? How many widows and the throwaways of society have been cared for as though they matter just as much as anyone else? How many have been educated and how many schools have been founded in the name of Jesus Christ? How many prisoners have been visited and changed by the influence, the positive influence of dedicated believers? How many people who are poor, men, women, and young ones alike, have been housed, fed, and cared for? How many addicts have found treatment? How many sober houses and rehabs have been founded by believers in service of their Lord? How many sick have been tended to? How many hospitals have been built in his name? How many lives have been positively impacted for Jesus Christ. I can take you to the most broken and destitute points on the globe, and there you will find the believers, though it may be small in number, who are working to be the salt of the earth. I can take you to Haiti, and I can show you a place where the education rate is so low, so many people are without education in the necessities of life, and I will show you ministries that in Jesus' name are working against all odds, against all earthly odds, to affect change. Operating from the conviction that they in Christ are called to change the world. I can take you to any locale in the U.S. And there I can show you people who are the salt of the earth, individually and corporately as churches, working to serve and to help those who are in need. Not just spiritually, but supported by finances. And, and a wellness in terms of physical health and beyond. I can show you men and women and young people who are laboring to make their world a better place by putting into practice the teachings of Jesus Christ in demonstrating his heart of love. Now, the secularist dreams of a world with no church. Can I be honest with you for a moment? I wouldn't want to live in such a place. Because if you were to immediately remove the influence of the Church of Jesus Christ overnight. You have to wonder how many charitable organizations and ministries of mercy would be over and how many millions, I would dare say billions of people, would go without that kind of aid. James 1.27, religion that God our Father. This is going to be a very common text today, by the way. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We are called to enhance. We are called to enrich. The next point regarding salt is that salt functioned as a preservative. For reasons beyond my chemical understanding in our time, salt has the ability to hinder or to restrain decay and decomposition. And again, in a world of extreme heat, by the way, the Middle East is hot. It's kind of hot all the time. It's like when you go to Haiti, I would, I would ask Taryn, what's the temperature like? 90-something. At any point of the year, what's the temperature like? That's ah, in the 90s. It's just always hot. And when you have no refrigeration in that kind of heat or no freezers, you think of how quickly food would decompose and would putrefy. So salt was a vital element for life and living. It was the means by which the ancients kept their food from quickly decomposing. If tomorrow we lost all means of electrical power, the devices didn't work, the remotes didn't work. You know what will be the most precious commodity or one of? Salt. It would be worth far more than your 401k in your iPhone. Christians have a salt-like role. We work to hinder and restrain the spiritual and the moral decay of the world in which we live. We function to preserve the truth in the ways of the Lord in an ever decomposing world. If you think the world is dark now, if you think it's crazy out there now, imagine it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit operating in and through his church. It would decay as quickly as meat in the desert sun. I can take you again to the farthest points on the globe, and there you will find the salt of the earth working against the moral decay of its time and context. I can take you to many churches in the local U.S. or any locale in the U.S., and you will find people there, teens, adults, 
clergy, laity, and beyond, working to advocate the fact that God is a God of love, but also truth, and that truth matters, and that we have no permission to change what he says. Because the church must stand firm against the influence of the world, functioning as salt, hear me clearly, will never be easy or popular. The world is continually working to redefine truth and or the standards of morality. Many of you probably don't watch the news, and that may not be the worst thing. But if you're aware of some of the happenings of our time, you kind of have to shake your head. Because everything in terms of right and wrong has seemed to have been flipped. In these days, as I've said many times, the only real sin is to believe that there is such a thing and to say so. We are in an age, and I don't want to get into the politics of this at all, but we are debating if a wall is moral but we celebrate and give standing applause to the abortion of unchecked millions. What in the world is wrong with us, and how confused can we be? Declaring that God's truth is fixed and his ways are unchanging will never win us any popularity contests. And if you think that's the case now, I'm saying this is a Lord forbid type thing, but just wait. It will always be easier for us to compromise and cave to the whims of the masses. Can I just put forth the general question, why do you think so many churches have caved? Ours is an age of moral compromise. You can find a church now that will condone and celebrate any deviant behavior or sinful lifestyle. We live in a time when the world is influencing the church much more than the church is influencing the world. That is not our calling. We are called to be salt. We are called to restrain and work against decay, not to hasten it along and move us closer to the Lord's judgment. Look at Matthew 5 again. Perhaps this is why the Lord offered his cautionary word. You are the salt of the earth. Fantastic. Wonderful. We have a calling and a role. But look at what he says. But if the salt loses its saltiness, can it be made salty again? Oh, it's, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now hear me, pure salt cannot be made less salty in one sense, but salt can become contaminated with other minerals and become far less effective. And what's to be done with salt that is contaminated? It's cast aside as worthless. I didn't say this, Jesus did, and trampled underfoot. It's a frightening concept, but if we're not willing to play our role, if we're the kind of people who will compromise and cave in and allow the worldly influences in, in a sense, and become thus contaminated, and we are rendered ineffective, what's our corporate and individual destiny? It would have to be the same. And again, you have to wonder to what degree, and I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, and I look at the, at the good in things, but when the Lord looks at many churches, does he see salt that he can use to preserve and work against evil? Or does he see contamination? That's a tough question and one that we have to wrestle with. Again, a religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. Again, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's both. Let's talk about the light of the world as I begin to move to the second part of this message. Verse 14, you, Jesus says, are the light of the world. Now darkness and light are rich images that appear throughout the entirety of the word and beyond. Darkness is often tied to the following things. Jot these down if you want. Ignorance, deception, and wickedness. When the word darkness is used or the imagery of darkness is employed, it's often connected with ignorance, deception, and wickedness. Now light, on the opposite end of the spectrum, is often tied to truth, clear spiritual perception, in this thing that we're going to call godliness. And I want to break this down just a little bit. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be light in two ways that I want to note. Number one, we are to be a shining beacon of truth to a lost and to a dark world. How many would readily admit that morally speaking and in terms of right and wrong and, and beyond, this is a pretty dark world that people are groping about with no clear answers? I've been studying just for my own 
development and beyond, a topic called Christian apologetics. And essentially an apologist in a, Bibli in, in a Christian sense is a person that specializes in, in, in defending and articul articulating Christianity in a relatable, effective way. Perhaps people like a Ravi Zacharias, if you know him at all, he's a good example of what an apologist would be for Christianity. And I've, I've discovered in about a month or two of looking into this topic, again, just on my own time for fun in a sense, that much of apologetics tends to get back to four fundamental questions that we as humans wrestle with. And this has been the case really from the beginning. Four words. Number one, if you're taking notes, origin. People wrestle with, how did we get here? Number two, meaning. Why am I here? Do I have any purpose? Number three, morality. Is there such a thing as a right and wrong? And how do I know which is which? And number four, destiny. What happens to me when I die? Now, you may never sit down, in a sense, in a formal way and say, I want to address the question of origin, and then the question of meaning, and then morality, and then destiny. But at some point, every human heart wrestles with these things. Why am I here? Does my life have any sense of purpose? Or is it just about going to work and going to school and, and doing the 8 to 4 or the 9 to 5 and maybe eventually having kids and then dying? And if I die, what happens then? How did I get here? Why am I here? Is there such a thing as a right and wrong that's objectively true and fixed and immovable, or is right and wrong just what I think it is today? People, again, even if they don't formulate it in, in formal ways, they wrestle with these things. And what amazes me is if you, were out, if you were to go out into the world and ask people their thoughts on this, the surprising array of answers. I would almost love to give you the homework assignment. Over the course of the week, talk to 10 people and say, how did we get here? Why are you here? Is there such a thing as a right and wrong? And what do you think happens when you die? You would get so many different answers, many of which are contradictory. A friend in the church and a church member sent me an advertisement of an event taking place, actually, I believe, in Barry this coming week. Basically having a discussion on death. What happens when I die? They're having cake, too. It's at the Woods Library, I believe. Yeah, they're having cake as well. So you're going to talk about cake, you know, in death at the same time. But there is a hunger out there. Think about this. Non-believers, secularists, people that are just living life are asking the question, what happens when we die? I wonder if a few of us should attend and say, you know, we don't want to be jerks, but you know, let, let's, this is what Christianity puts forth. And here's why it says this. And this is what Jesus did. It's not just, it's not just philosophy. People wrestle with this stuff, and they have no answers. They're groping around in a dark world, and they're paying the price for their ignorance. And the enemy is more than happy to deceive. But the church, as the light of the world, serves as a vehicle to illuminate the way. We possess the truth of the word, and with it we shed light on such things. The funny thing is, is for each of those questions, the Bible has plenty of answers. And maybe we as believers should be a little bit more adept in answering them. So how did we get here? Why are we here? Is there a right and a wrong? And how do I know? And what happens to me when I die? Oh, Jesus has a lot to say on each of those. The whole of Scripture sheds much light on that. And we as the church are to be the conduits through which that message is communicated. If you won't defend the truth of God's word, who will? You know, nature abhors a vacuum. If you won't raise your kids in the Lord, someone else will. The enemy will happily take that role. If we won't stand for truth, that there actually is objective, real, immutable, unchangeable truth, who will? Which leads to the second point, how can we hope to defend God's word if we don't know it? 
I'm saying this in love. We are generationally the most biblically illiterate group of Christians the world has ever seen. Please don't be offended by that. That is a challenge to open your Bible and to read it. And the funny thing is, is we have so much access to resources that help us to understand what the Word has to say. People say to me, even years into their Christian service, I read the Bible, I don't get anything out of it. So they just stop. If that's you, ask the question, Pastor, how can I go deeper in my life in the Word so that I, I can unpack what it has to say and then apply it? I will be happy to help you with that. That's part of what this is, by the way. This is one arena whereby we train people in terms of what the Word has to say. But we are the light of the world. We are a beacon of truth. Number two, the second part of this, we are to be shining beacons of godliness in a dark world. What is godliness? Well, I've already given you the answer twice. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Really two themes here. True godliness is characterized by a personal holiness. This goes back to the theme of becoming contaminated. We are not to live our lives as the world does. We are called to be different. And that's okay. For some reason in recent decades, the Church of Jesus Christ has had the idea that if we become more worldly, we'll have more luck in reaching the world. And that has not worked out at all. Do you realize that in many, in many ways, your strength as a witness comes from being different? I can recall I was at UMass Amherst. I came to Christ when I was a sophomore in college. And for two years, I did the, I did the ways of the world and did all that. And then for two years, I tried to serve him as best as I could. And UMass was a very difficult place to try to say no to sin because there's 30,000 kids in a square mile and there's always something negative going on. And my friends, Lord bless them, they weren't believers, but they would continually try to get me along, to go along with different things. Come to this party, come do this, come do that. And I kind of felt like a broken record, but the common answer was, I'll get dinner with you and I'll hang out at the, at the apartment or at the dorm, but I'm not going to go to the bar, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to the club, I'm not going to the front. And they were relentless in trying week after week after week, month after month for two years. And the Lord empowered me not to cave in and go along. When we, when we were about to graduate, one of my classmates pulled me aside, one of my good friends, and said, you know, James, we gave you a hard time on purpose because we were trying to get you to cave. And you didn't. And we respect that. Tell us about Jesus. Now, I'd love to say that they got radically saved. That didn't happen at that point. But that, that, that desire to say no to the worldly influence and just to say yes to Jesus opened doors. I never would have opened if I just said, yeah, I'll just go along. It's okay to have a few drinks. I'll just get drunk once, twice, a bunch of times. I'll just do what you're doing and it'll all be good. John MacArthur says a godly life testifies to the true and transforming power of God. The other piece of this isn't just holiness, but it's love. We are called to be agents of love. How can people come to understand the kindness and the compassion and the mercy of the Lord without an example? Do you want to know how people come to recognize these factors of God's heart? It's through us. And oftentimes, it's, it's the small things. You know, everything that we do in service to the Lord and in service of others is charged with eternal meaning. Jesus put it this way, and I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase it. Even giving a cup of cold water in my name, that, inherit, that engenders reward, eternal reward. Now, you may not be able to sing an incredible solo or speak before the masses, but how many of you are able to say, hey, you look thirsty, do you want some water? I can do that. Anybody can do that. We can find ways to encourage and to show love and to be there when people need us. And Jesus says, let your light shine before others. Not to elevate you. Wow, that person's fantastic. Isn't Byron the best? No. That they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. It's okay to be different. It's okay to stand out. It's okay to be that agent of love in a world full of people who are just naturally selfish. And that's true of us at times as well. 
And that's why the Lord offered this cautionary word as well. Let's pick it up in verse 14 of Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. They put it on a stand instead. And it gives life to everyone, or it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and again glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus didn't save you and transform you just so you can hide out in a back room and not tell anybody about it. There is a time, New England Christians, we have to open our mouth and talk and say, you know, I lived in different parts of the country. And ours is unique, very reserved, very serious. Unless the Pats are on, then we're nuts. By the way, good game last week. Very, very composed. We don't talk to people. Have you ever had a conversation with your neighbor about Jesus? How about your relatives? How about your kids? All of our sophistication and intelligence and being reserved and such doesn't make us very good witnesses sometimes. You go out of this place, you let your light shine. Not to draw attention to you, but to identify a God that can truly save and truly transform and empower a certain kind of life that is not characterized by sin and beyond, but that's characterized by personal holiness and Matthew 5, 13 through 16, identify the fact that we as Christians, in summary, we are called to bring enhancement and enrichment. We are called to hinder the moral decay and the rot of our time. We are commissioned to be beacons of God's unchanging and timeless truth, and we are called to be beacons of godliness, speaking of holiness and love. What happens when the church fails to function as salt and light? We are living the result. But I ask the question as I close, what happens when the church chooses to function as salt and light? The simple answer, the world has changed. Do you realize that our spiritual forefathers, the original disciples, were literally just a very small handful of people? And in a matter of a few short decades, they completely changed what was a totally pagan world. In just 30 or 40 years, 12 became a few hundred, a few hundred became 3,000 on day one. And then it just spread because these people were committed to something bigger than themselves. And if we, I believe, will recognize our calling and work to accomplish that calling and consider the cautions of Christ found in Matthew 5 and beyond, we can change the world or at least our part of it. Who knows the impact that we can have on our personal Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But we have to know who we are and what we are in him. It's time we expect more of ourselves. It's time for greater expectations in every good direction. Father, I give this word praying that it stirs me personally. Because, Father, Lord, long before I shared this word here today, you've been speaking this to my heart regarding my need to change in terms of what I expect of myself. Lord, you have called me to be salt and light, and I want to play that role. And I pray for those who are here today, or those, God, who will listen to this sermon online and, and they will hear these words or read the notes. Speak to us, God. Open our hearts to the potential that you have called us to. To be salt, to be light, to bring about change in this world and to change the world or at least our part of it. Help us to be faithful and help us to believe you for more. It's a season, God, of greater expectations. Open our eyes and our hearts to what could be in and through you. And we thank you for this time in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone says, Amen.